Hello and welcome to my very first ever YouTube video. This is wild. This is wild. Um, thank you so, so much for being here. I really appreciate you. We're going to have so much fun today. And not in the way where a teacher says that to you at the beginning of a really boring lesson about something. My name is Kate McDuffie, and I'm an educator and performing artist, but on Fantasy YouTube land, I am going by Lady McDuff. The reason I'm going by Lady McDuff, and the reason I'm here in general, is because I really want to take this opportunity to meld everything I love so much in this little life, i.e. Shakespeare, Star Trek, accessible education, community building, people, learning things, doing things, making things, and make it an enjoyable, fun internet experience for all. Also, I promise if you blindly subscribe to this YouTube channel with only one video on it and ring that little notification bell, you will find yourself thinking later when I have posted more exciting videos, well, I really do not regret that decision one little bit. So as I mentioned previously, I am very passionate about Shakespeare and accessible education, and especially how the two of those intersect. By accessible education, I mean teaching styles, educational materials, and entire systems that are built for people who have different learning styles, different strengths, challenges, and needs. It really is just breaking down those barriers that limit access to information, knowledge, and personal growth because barriers are trash. We don't like them here on this channel. But today, we are going to take part in the time-honored tradition of YouTube, which is rating things. And by rating things, I mean grading things because this is an educator's channel and we have rubrics. For this video, we are venturing to our first stop on a multi-part journey in what will be rating, or rather grading, Shakespeare editions based on their accessibility and their content. What we're actually going to be doing is reviewing, rating, grading, every edition of Shakespeare eventually. Um, and for continuity's sake, we're going to be doing it with one of my most favorite displays, Macbeth. We are starting with one of the most beloved, one of the most well-known, but also one of the most controversial, perhaps, editions of Shakespeare. Let's get into it. Yes, today we are grading the Spark Notes No Fear Shakespeare editions. Yay! Spoiler alert, this is one of my favorite editions of Shakespeare. And I say that as an educator and as an actor because it truly does make Shakespeare accessible to all types of readers and to all types of learners and to all types of people with all types of relationships to Shakespeare. But it is not without its faults. So what is a Shakespeare edition? How were they made? Why are there so many of them? Which one do I read? And aren't they just Shakespeare's words put into nice pretty font in a nice little book? For a thorough answer to this question, I'm actually going to refer you to an episode called Editing Shakespeare from the incredible Folger Shakespeare Library podcast, Shakespeare Unlimited. In this interview, editor Suzanne Gossett states, we have no manuscripts of Shakespeare's plays and poems in his hand. Consequently, we have these printed texts which may or may not convey what Shakespeare had in mind at the moment that he was writing. We don't even actually know whether Shakespeare ever revised any of his own plays, but we certainly have, for half the plays, more than one single text of such well-known plays as Hamlet and Lear and Romeo. There she's talking about the Cordos and the First Folio, which were editions or compilations of Shakespeare's plays made by his contemporaries, and in the case of the First Folio, after Shakespeare's death. Editor Paul Werstein says that 
Additions have a dual purpose of conservation and mediation. So that what editors have tried to do is preserve the texts, but at the same time, from the very beginning, they've been mediating between the readership and the text. So what Wurstein means here by mediating between the readership and the text is modernizing the text and making it more accessible for people to read, like modernizing the, you know, wacky ye olde English spelling, and then also providing context in the footnotes and introductions, for example. I think the idea of an addition being the mediator between the reader and the text is a really important thing to consider when considering the effectiveness of the edition, because every reader is going to go into reading Shakespeare with a different background perspective and purpose. So the No Fear Shakespeare edition is undoubtedly designed for students in school who are learning about literary analysis. That's their purpose. So the contextual aids in the No Fear Shakespeare are designed to mediate that very specific relationship. Yeah, since I'm part educator, part actor, I'm bringing that lens into everything as well. The question always seems to come up when talking about this edition is like, should actors be using this edition of Shakespeare? And one of the reasons why actors are so kind of discouraged from using the No Fear Shakespeare is precisely the reason why it is so beloved. It's because of the translations of the Shakespeare text into a modern language. By providing translations instead of footnotes, the No Fear Shakespeare is essentially doing what's seen as an important part of the actor's preparation, which is reading all of those footnotes, the introduction, the historical cultural performance context of the play, and constructing one's own meaning out of it. Do I have the receipts that actors, you know, are widely discouraged from using the No Fear Shakespeare? I do not. But what I do have is this quote by the great and iconic Shakespearean director and scholar Peter Hall from his book, Shakespeare's Advice to the Players. Years ago, I directed Dustin Hoffman as Shylock. He tried, great actor as he is, to get in touch with the character's feeling by improvisation. It is a common and valued technique among modern actors. To aid him, Dustin brandished one of those dismal editions that have Shakespeare's text on the one side and an approximate, sometimes very approximate, modern English version on the page opposite. Assisted by this crib, he worked the scenes in modern speech. So obviously he's reading this edition to filth and he's not really a fan. But on to the grading. One might be grading these Shakespeare editions based on their adherence to folio punctuation or how pretty the cover art is or how good they are for actors. But here on this channel, we are all about accessibility. So we're going to be rating this edition on its accessibility in five different criteria. I'm giving each one of these criteria one to five bards. One being that the criteria was not met whatsoever and five being excellent. And you know, 1.5 to four, 0.5 being somewhere in between for reasons that I will go into. So number one is access. Simply, can I get it for free? Access starts with, can I literally access the resource? Differentiation. Does this edition come in multiple versions? A printed copy, an online copy, an audiobook, a graphic version, or does it just come in one version? The readability. Is the text easily trackable? Is it formatted cleanly? Is it graphically organized pleasantly? And the contextual aids. This one is really tough because there are a lot of factors that can go into the effectiveness and the quality of the contextual aids, i.e. the footnotes or the introduction, and in the case of the No Fear Shakespeare, the translations. In essence, how effective is this edition in helping its audience grasp the meaning of the play and what kind of depth of meaning and context 
do these aids provide? So first, let's talk about access. Almost every single thing that the No Fear Shakespeare provides is free and available online. So every single one of the 37 plays they have of Shakespeare here have a study guide, quizzes, analyses, and writing help. However, only 24 of the plays have translations, meaning they only have text for 24 of the plays. I'm sorry, there are people talking in my alley. I live right next to one. Have a good brunch. I want a brunch. Honestly, Spark Notes, if you're watching, ooh, sorry. I touched my mic. Can you please make a translation of King John? It's one of my top most favorite history plays. It's highly underrated and highly underperformed. And I think it would be really cool if it were taught for a lot of different reasons that I won't go into right now. But um, if we could work on a translation for KJ, that would be incredible. Thank you. But what they do have are translations of Shakespeare's 154 sonnets, including a translation of the sonnet dedication, which is really, really cool as well. So as for the grade, just because not all of the plays exist in this edition, like you simply couldn't read some of the plays in No Fear Shakespeare edition, I gotta give it four out of five parts. But the accessibility of the plays that they do have is absolutely stellar. Congratulations. So differentiation. You got the Shakespeare text. You've got the translation. You've got a couple of graphic novels for some of the plays. So let's actually take a look at the graphic novel. We have an overview of the characters, um, summaries by act, and little buttons for each scene, which is graphically organized so beautifully. So if you take a look at the characters, again, like if you have trouble keeping track of who's who, it's really nice to have a visual representation of these characters to go off of. And they have just a very, very brief description of who they are. Um, but then, yeah, if you're better at recognizing faces than you are names, then this is, this is a great option. So if we take a look at Act 1, Scene 1, they have um, all of the tiles laid out here. So let's actually just click on this. So here we have the first page of Act 1, Scene 1, which is so beautiful. Let's click on the next page. By the way, I do have the hard copy version, and the comic is in black and white, so which is still stunning, but it's really nice to have this very moody color. It really gives a sense of the mood of play. It is a handwritten font, but it's still very clear in my you know, opinion. And something that the graphic novel does, which is really interesting, is they use some of Shakespeare's actual text in the bubbles. So for instance, this very first frame right here, when shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain, that's the Shakespearean text. Whereas in the No Fear Shakespeare translation, it's when should the three of us meet again? Will it be in thunder, lightning, or rain? So something that they do here is keep some of the cool Shakespeare language, some of the language that's, you know, really kind of straightforward, which I love. Taking a look at the next slide, when the turmoil of battle is complete, when one side has won and the other has lost. In the No Fear Shakespeare, it says, we'll meet when the noise of the battle is over, when one side has won and the other side has lost. So there's a little bit of a difference in the language that they use for the graphic novel and for the No Fear Shakespeare. And I gotta say, I really kind of like the translations that they have in the graphic novel, as well as the fact that they use some of Shakespeare's original text that some may find unnecessary for translating because it's pretty straightforward. They also offer this transcript up here I actually haven't, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I haven't actually taken a look at this yet. So this is great. So they have this transcript next to it. 
So it actually gives the characters. And so if you are wanting this read aloud, you can highlight the text here and have it read aloud to you while you're you know, using your text-to-speech option on your computer while you're looking at the graphic novel. So this online resource for the graphic novel is absolutely incredible. And because they have this, you know, of course you can zoom in as far as you want. And they have this transcript option where you can highlight and use text-to-speech. It's amazing. I love it. And it's all available for free online, which is absolutely incredible. The one thing, it, well, they do have is an audiobook for the most popularly taught plays in schools, but they are not free. So for that, I'm going to give it 4.5 out of 5 bards. Readability. So what I actually have here is the regular edition of the No Fear Shakespeare and the Deluxe Student Edition. They are both really, really great. Um, they have borders along the Shakespeare side and just a reminder at the bottom of the page, I don't know if you can see it, Hi. Um, original text and then it says modern, <laughs> my face, modern text over here. And in the Deluxe Student Edition, it's even better because they have these really large gray borders around the original text and the margins are huge. So, you know, thinking back about our audience, which is students, um, a lot of teachers require that students write annotations in the margins. So these really big margins are great because they allow students to write notes in them without sacrificing any of the readability, which is really awesome. Something that I love about the layout of these, the hard copy books, is that they have these really cool tabs on the side, which represent the five acts. So if I wanted to get to act five, I can see my little tab here and just open up to act five really easily. So hooray for layout. It looks really, really good. And then of course, online, you can zoom in as far as you want. So that's really, really cool. And the fact that it's online, you can highlight it and use your text to speech option if you would rather hear the words. I just wanted to do a little post-filming pop-in and add that, again, because this edition is designed for educational purposes, I'm going to be a little bit, quote unquote, harder on it than other editions maybe. And note that what I'm not finding is a readily available edition specifically designed for visually impaired individuals. My research, of course, involved just a little bit of Googling, but I mean, I went to the third page of Google and didn't really find anything. Um, it appears that they have to be specially made, and I just think it would be great if they existed already. So I mentioned that you can zoom in as far as you like, but I just want to add that depending on what device you're using, the formatting can get out of whack and make it difficult for people to read zoomed in as such. So for that reason, I'm actually just going to give it 4.5 out of 5 bards. Contextual aids. Here's where it gets tricky. I cannot judge the No Fear Shakespeare on their footnotes and introduction because... They do not have them. But what I will do is attempt to assess the many contextual aids that they do provide. So let's actually take a look at their website to see the full scope of that. They have these great tabs for the translations, the graphic novel, memes, and I cannot stress enough how fantastic, important, vital, crucial the memes are for contextualizing the play and putting them in a modern, relatable perspective. So, well done, SparkNotes. Keep it up. They also have lesson plans for teachers and this really cool infographic, which is absolutely stunning. Again, the differentiation here for different styles of learners is chef's kiss. I mean, visual learners are shooketh. But perhaps the most dense section is the study guide. 
So here we have the summary, characters, literary devices, questions and answers, quotes, quizzes, essays, and further study. The best thing about this is, again, how it's all graphically organized and the information is so easy to find. I can't tell you how great that is for people with executive functioning disorders to have that all organized and laid out. It's great. As far as how this edition helps one remember and understand what's in the play, A plus, okay? Like the summary, the list of characters, quizzes, and translations are all great tools for those purposes. And for many, you know, they are the door that allows readers to walk right on through that language barrier and the importance of that should not be understated. The sections of the study guide that do not thrill me are the in-depth character analyses, the questions and answers, and the further study. To make a long story short, I think that the character analyses and the question and answers sections make some pretty presumptuous assertions about the inner psychological workings of the character and their motives. And I do not care for it. No, I do not. They tend to paint these characters in really broad brush strokes and offer really just one interpretation of the character when in fact the options are endless for how to interpret these characters and analyze them. To me, this is the most obvious of course, in the way that they analyze Lady Macbeth and her relationship to her husband. So let's take a look. So in the character analysis for Macbeth, there's a line that says, quote, after the murder, however, her powerful personality begins to disintegrate, leaving Macbeth increasingly alone. Excuse me, um, can someone remind me Whomst was hosting a fabulous banquet while at the same time somebody else was seeing ghosts? Okay, who's disintegrating faster there? In fact, it was at this banquet that we learn that Macbeth has taken steps on his own, has made arrangements and made decisions without his dearest partner of greatness. It is at this banquet that we learn that he's left her alone. So, and while we're on the subject of Mrs. Macbeth, let's obviously take a look at her character analysis, shall we? It reads, Lady Macbeth is one of Shakespeare's most famous and frightening female characters. I mean, A plus for the alliteration, but Boo, for the frightening? Like, says whomst. It's a little bit dehumanizing to reduce somebody to just a couple of adjectives. When we first see her, she is already plotting Duncan's murder, and she is stronger, more ruthless, and more ambitious than her husband. Like, again, it's all up for debate, right? You can get textual evidence to support that or to support something else. As for the question and answer section, let's take a look at this question. How does Lady Macbeth persuade Macbeth to kill King Duncan? So it says, Lady Macbeth's tactics work. Even though Macbeth is disgusted by his wife's ruthlessness, he resolves to kill Duncan. There, okay, so there's nothing really in the text to support that Macbeth feels disgusted by his wife's ruthlessness. I mean, it says everywhere in here that, you know, supposedly the hold that she has over him is a sexual one. And they have this like very compatible sexual relationship. So... I mean, we should ask ourselves, why would she do something or behave in a way that he would find disgusting? And if he really did find it disgusting, why did it work? In every production I've ever seen, it's been staged as a turn on. So I feel like creating this narrative about Macbeth and Lady Macbeth 
that he is this valiant, ambitious soldier who only committed a murder because his sexually manipulative wife made him do it, is playing a dangerous game because you're really then encouraging readers to come away with this notion of women are responsible for the actions of men and women sexually manipulate men to get what they want and turn them bad. When in reality, this man was unseeming people from the nave to the chops from the get-go and went from zero to murder instantly upon hearing this prophecy before his wife had anything to do with it, before she even knew the wiser. Maybe what we can do is get the reader to think more about why it is she does what she does instead of just telling us what she is. <sighs> so, is this flattering? My solution for Spark Notes is to maybe consider constructing their character analyses and question and answers with some more diverse lenses. I mean, it is a play after all, so maybe let's think about the actor's lens. Like how would an actor approach playing this role, you know? Or let's use some other literary lenses like a feminist lens or a critical race lens. Maybe instead of providing very simple, straightforward answers to very complex and nuanced questions, they could instead, you know, ask more questions, get the reader to think critically about the characters because that's what this whole thing is about, right? Maybe they could provide different perspectives using those different lenses. So when they ask a question, here's one way to think of it. Here's another way to think of it through this lens. Here's another way to think of it through this lens. So that way, readers are getting the idea that there is more than one way to think about, about it because that's what we love about Shakespeare, right? Like, it's up for interpretation. There isn't just one right answer. Although some answers are probably a little bit more right or at least a little sexier than others. So think about that. In the meantime, if you are a reader of Spark Notes and you are using this resource, which you should because it's great, just remember that this edition is mediating your understanding of the play and the characters within it. And just keep in mind, this is not the definitive answer to these questions. You can make up your own. So coming back to the intended audience, of this edition, which is students and teachers. I am seeing the youths of today demand so much more out of their education, and I love to see it. They're, they're really demanding much more attention to these socio-political issues, and we have to meet them there. The thing that is going to keep Shakespeare alive for another four plus centuries is this examination of the intersection of race, class, gender, power, and privilege, you know, within Shakespeare's plays. And Shakespeare already writes it into his plays, right? Like, it's why they've endured for so long. Which brings me to my final qualm, which is with the further reading section. There are so many incredible scholars who are doing all of this work, writing all of these great essays, doing all this great research to bring Shakespeare into our modern lives by examining those intersections. Like how do all of these things come into play in his works? And what I would just like to say to Spark Notes about their further reading section is that I would love to see a little bit more diversity and representation in the expertise that is presented in these further reading sections. For example, this Cambridge Companion to Shakespeare and Race is absolutely incredible. Look at that beautiful Adrian Lester on the cover, just for a second, okay? Look at him, look at him. And it's edited by the incredible and iconic Ayana Thompson, who is an absolute genius and a scholar. It's so important to get these perspectives and I don't see any of them in the further reading section. So 
I think that Sparknotes can do a little bit of work on that front. I think that Sparknotes has a real opportunity here to reevaluate and reframe the narratives they're kind of pushing through the character analyses and questions and answers sections by considering more modern lenses through which to view the play. And on that note, there's really an opportunity to update some of the resources that they provide in the further reading section. Like here's one, for instance. It's going to help us ask the really vital, really important questions. These questions that keep Shakespeare so alive and so fresh in all of our minds. So after all of that, I give the contextual aids 3.5 out of 5 bards for all of the reasons I just mentioned. Okay, so that was a lot. Let's recap, shall we? Access. Four bards. Almost all free. Almost all online. The only thing is that I physically can't read some of the plays, so we're giving it a four out of five. Differentiation. 4.5 out of 5 bards. I would just like to see some more options for audiobooks that are free as well. For readability, I'm going to give it 4.5 out of 5 bards. An excellent effort, many options for different people who like to read hard copies online, options to zoom in on the text online, do text-to-speech, even for the graphic novel version. However, i just like to see some more options for visually impaired individuals, and so I'm giving it a 4.5 out of 5. And contextual aids, 3.5 out of 5 bards. Lots of help with basic understanding of the plot points, great resources for tracking the text-based evidence, which is absolutely incredible and super helpful. But I'm really missing some of the historical, cultural, and performance context that would help give me a more deep, profound, and meaningful understanding of the characters in the play. And there's a lack of diversity in the critical lenses used in the character analyses, questions and answers, and further reading section. And much like the wildly popular television series, Whose Line Is It Anyway?, these points don't really matter. But if we are counting them up, No Fear Shakespeare gets 16.5 out of 20 bards. Congratulations, Spark Notes. So I just wanted to come back to the question, should actors be using the No Fear Shakespeare edition? I know I kind of left it up in the air at the beginning there. And my answer is 1,010% yes. It's a fantastic resource, and why not use every single resource at your disposal? Um, I would only recommend using it in conjunction with another edition, so that you can get the juicy footnotes and introductions there. In conclusion, yes, we're almost done. Returning again to the audience, the intended audience of this edition, mediating the relationship between the reader and the text. No Fear Shakespeare is such a vital resource in this regard because it really does help mediate the relationship between its intended audience and the text through these great translations, resources, and absolutely fire memes. And it provides some great tools for helping people write literary analysis. It truly makes Shakespeare more accessible to diverse readers and audiences because it does a lot of that work to break down the barriers that the language can sometimes create. However, I think Sparknotes could improve their already incredible offerings by updating their critical lens to reflect more diverse perspectives. Woo! We made it. We made it. If you're still here, first of all, why? Second of all, thank you. Thank you so much for sticking with me and for learning with me and for going on this journey with me. I wish I could give you all such a big, warm hug, um, but I can't. I'm also dying to hear what you have to say about all of this. So please comment down below and let me know what you think. I really hope to create a community here and I love hearing diverse perspectives and how wrong I am about things and getting into arguments and debates, friendly debates on the internet. No, I don't. Nobody does. But I'm here for it. I'll allow it. 
So again, thank you so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. <laughs> you know who's the MVP of this play? Macduff. We love him. He's the best. He chops his head off. Hail, king, for so thou art. Behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. Cursed head. Look familiar? <sighs> I love you, peace stew. I would never decapitate you. And cut. Whoo, great work, folks. Wow. Clap, 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 clap. Bye-bye.